Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing another integral and this one's kind of involves some trig and it also is going to end up using Feynman's trick at the end. I, mean, I got this one from Maths 505 and he solved it in one way that I actually thought was a bit kind of long and convoluted and I think this one's a little neater so I wanted to share it. So, uh, first thing we're always going to do when we spot cos 2x is is do what it's asking us to do really, which is to use the double angle formula. And for cos, that's the cos 2x equals cos squared x minus sine squared x. And instantly, we're gonna know, we know that we kind of wanna use that because we've got cos x and tan x here in our denominator. So it, it seems to make most sense to have everything with x's inside of the brackets rather than a 2x. So let's make that expansion now. So we've now got cos squared x minus sine squared x over the same denominator we had before, which just in case you didn't see was ln tan x multiplied by cos to the four x dx. So now that we've got um, cos and sine to various powers in our numerator and denominator. I'm going to split our fraction up and write it in terms of different trig functions, bearing in mind obviously that 1 over cos x is equal to sec x and that sin x over cos x is equal to tan x. So with that in mind, if we just ignore the ln tan x for now, because that's not really going to change, what we've got is cos squared x over ln tan x, but let's just ignore it for now, cos to the 4x minus sine squared x over, again, we'll just ignore the ln tan x for now, we'll put it back in when we get to actually rewriting the integral, over cos to the 4x as well. So with cos squared x over cos to the 4x, we've got some really simple cancellation here. We're just going to end up with 1 over cos squared x, and that can also be written as sec squared x. And over here, what we've got really is sine squared x over cos squared x times 1 over cos squared x. And the reason we're going to write it like that is because given that sine x over cos x is tan, that must be tan squared x and then we must have a sec squared x left over here. So let's rewrite our integral again. So this is an equal to the integral from zero to pi over four of sec squared x minus tan squared x sec squared x divided by the natural log of tan x dx. And as soon as you see sec squared x in any integral where you've got tan, especially one where tan is inside of a natural log, we know we have to make a u sub. I mean, from the beginning of looking at this integral, we should have gotten the sense that at some point we're making a tan substitution. And, and even Maths 505 did that. But he did a really long one that involves a lot of simplification and writing sine and cos in terms of it. Here we don't have to, because the derivative of tan x is sec squared x. And actually we have a factor of sec squared x dx in our rewritten integral. If we were to factor sec squared x out like this, then making the substitution u equals tan x would yield that du equals sec squared x dx. And we've got this sec squared x dx right here. So this makes our substitution really easy. We've just got to look at the bounds. So as x goes to zero, tan x is also going to zero. And as x goes to pi over four, tan x will approach one, given that tan of pi over four is one. So now that we've made our substitution, let's clear some space at the top and rewrite our integral. And by the way, I'm gonna call our integral i, just so we can keep track. I'm going to say this is equal to the integral from 0 to 1, because our bounds have changed, of 1 minus u squared divided by the natural log of u with respect to u. And 
at every space here I've just swapped tan with U and I've removed our sex squared DX and replaced it with DU. So this integral actually may look familiar to some of you who have come across Feynman's technique before. But if you haven't, don't worry, because I'm going to teach you how to use it. And the reason it's going to look, the reason that it kind of looks like we should be using Feynman's technique here is because we know how to differentiate uh, exponentials. So given a function y equals a to the x, we know that that means the natural log of y equals x times the natural log of a, which means that dy dx times 1 over y is equal to the natural log of a, and therefore if we multiply by y, which is a to the x, that the derivative with respect to x is ln a times a to the x. And that works, especially as you can, this kind of reveals why e to the x differentiates to itself, because of course ln e is just 1, and so all we get left with is the exponential part. But anyway, um, we're going to use this fact that when you differentiate an exponential, a natural log gets pulled down to kind of uh, simplify uh, this fraction that we're looking at that's got a natural log on the denominator. And the way that we do that is by creating a function in terms of an integral. So we're going to define a function i of alpha as equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus u to the power of alpha divided by the natural log of u with respect to u, which implies that the integral that we're looking for is equal to the function evaluated at alpha equal 2. So all we've got to do at the end is remember to plug alpha in as 2 and then we'll have our answer. So the rule that Feynman's technique relies on is differentiation under the integral sign, which says that the derivative of this function which is defined is equal to the derivative with respect to alpha of the integral, which is just kind of common sense, everybody would know that. But what's not quite common sense, which Leibniz tells us, is that that's equal to the partial derivative with respect to alpha under the integral sign. And as we looked at before, the derivative of u to the alpha is going to be ln u, u to the alpha, when we're differentiating with respect to, the al with respect to alpha. So, hang on, let's just create some space. What we're saying now is that i prime of alpha equals the integral from 0 to 1 of the derivative with respect to alpha of 1 over ln u minus u to the alpha over ln u du. Now this is a constant because there's nothing in terms of alpha here, so the derivative of a constant is always 0. And here the derivative of u to the alpha is just ln u u to the alpha and therefore we're going to get a cancellation here, right? And so our integral has tidied up really nicely. Let's pull the negative out. And so we now know that the derivative of our integral function is negative the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the alpha with respect to u. This is just power rule, right? Everyone knows how to do this. We're going to add 1 to the power and divide by our new power. And of course it's bounded between 1 and 0. Now when u equals 1, we're going to have negative 1 over alpha plus 1. And when u equals 0, we're just going to have 0. And so this tells us that our, the derivative of our integral function i prime of alpha is equal to 1 over alpha plus 1. And what that means is that i of alpha must be equal to the integral of negative 1 over alpha plus 1 with respect to alpha. And this is how Feynman's trick works. We take an integral that's initially in terms of some other variable u we introduce a parameter alpha that helps us to simplify a somewhat messy integral into one that's very easy. 
we then it has to be bounded so that we end up with an output that's just in terms of alpha and we then integrate this output with respect to our parameter alpha to find a new expression for the value of our integral. In this case this is a really easy integral this is just going to be equal to the negative natural log of alpha plus one but we're going to have a plus c and we don't want to have a plus c because we want to know exactly what this integral is equal to so let's return back to our original expression for alpha and i'm going to rewrite it here so that we can keep track so we've just found out that i of alpha is equal to negative ln absolute value of alpha plus one plus c, and we want to find out what c is, but let's not forget that, that this is also equal to the integral from zero to one of one minus u to the alpha divided by ln u du. So how can we find out what our plus c is? Well, observe that if we put alpha as equal to zero, then this means that i of alpha is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus u to the 0 divided by ln u, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And the integral of 0 is 0. So that tells us that i of 0 equals 0, which equals negative ln well, 0 plus 1, which is 1 plus c. The natural log of 1 asks what power of e gives me 1. Well, everybody knows that's 0. So we have 0 equals c. And so we know that we don't have to worry about our constant of integration because c is equal to 0. And therefore, the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus u to the alpha over ln u du is just equal to negative the natural log of whatever our power alpha is plus 1. And in our case up here, we said that alpha was equal to 2. And so that means that i is equal to i evaluated that alpha equals 2, which is negative ln 3. So I hope that was helpful and a good introduction to Feynman's trick. Let me know if there's any other things you want me to go over in the future. Thanks for watching.